Welcome to our second module in Introduction to Remote Sensing. This particular module introduces the aerial photography side of things in, in remote sensing. So we're looking at an airborne platform in this case. And, um, and it, this has also become a very hot topic uh, in the last couple of years just because of the use of drones. So I'm not going to focus a lot on drones in this particular module, but I'm going to talk about kind of the bigger picture of what aerial photography is and how it works and um, and some of the math that comes with it. So the overall outcome of this module is to defend the use of photographic systems and aerial photography techniques for environmental assessments. So really the, the outcome becomes that it's an introduction to what this is and then how we apply it to environmental assessments kind of pulls together in the end. The next module actually gets into more of the environmental assessment applications, so we'll do that in module three. So module, or mo bleh, <laughs> I'm going to put all my words together in one word. Objective 2.1 is list the advantages of aerial photography over on the ground observations. Now there are lots of different advantages, so I also included some disadvantages here. So we think about being on the ground and you're looking around at an area why why would that be worse off than air, aerial photography and why would it be better? So one of the major advantages of aerial photography is that you get this picture of what is on the ground. And so you can see basically what your eyes would see, but you also get, it also makes, allows it to be like interpreted very easily, but at a bigger picture, right? Like a bigger area all at the same time. So instead of looking at a map, which is where you're basing everything on symbols, now we can actually see a real view of what we're looking for. Um, so because you're looking at, hey, this is the ground, this is, you know, there's water and trees and roads and everything else, it's really easy to interpret and it can be used very quickly. It doesn't require a lot of processing for you to understand what you are looking at. One of the biggest advantages of using aerial photography over being on the ground is that you can use it in remote, inaccessible areas. So if you can't get there on foot or you can't get there by car, you can hop on an airplane and take these aerial photos and you can determine what's going on in those areas. So it, especially let's think um, like forest fires, for example, it's a really good example of inaccessible areas and usually remote. Um, if I'm flying a drone, I can see those areas where that, that fire is, and then I can send in the right people to that location. Otherwise, it might be just a whole bunch of smoke and we actually can't see flames. So the other thing too with aerial photography is that it has a real-time capture um, component to it, I guess characteristic. And that means that I'm accessing that data in real time. So it, it records it, and then we have that moment in time that's captured and it's a permanent record. So you can think of this, like for example, a flood, I can almost video a flood with aerial photography. You could video a flood with aerial photography and look at each individual frame of that, vi that video. And then you're going to be able to say, hey, over this time and at this exact date, time, hour, all of that happens and this is what it looks like at that time. So you can really track a lot of things with it. Then it also has this large area coverage. So if you're on foot, there's only so much you can see with your eyes and over a certain amount of time, right? Let's say you're walking. I mean, how far can you hike in a day? How far do you think an airplane can go in a day, right? So you get a much larger area coverage. You also have an improved vantage point from being above. Like I was saying with the um, forest fires, I can see down. I don't have to be in it in order to see it. I also have improved spectral sensitivity. So when I'm using aerial photography, I can use different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is really important for determining different aspects of the environment around us. And we can also improve the spatial resolution and the geometry. So when I say that, that means that if I'm on the ground, my eyes cannot zoom in but I can zoom in with an aerial photo, right? Then with geometry, I can calculate distances and angles with very few issues. <laughs> there, there's still some math that kind of adds on to what we, we, we're going to cover in this class, but 
for the most part, the geometry is pretty straightforward. So some of the disadvantages, because it always needs to be thrown in there, I can't always like make it sound perfect. <laughs> so um, let's say you take a photograph and you have trees. Sometimes those trees can obscure other information that we're trying to get. So for example, if I'm trying to look at um, a some sort of like soil contamination underneath trees, I may not be able to see that contamination. I might be able to identify an issue because of the health of the trees, but I can't actually see what's going on in the soil itself. The position of the aerial photo and the scale are technically approximate. So the airplane has two different systems on it. One's called a GPS and the other one's called an INS. Both of those will tell you what that airplane is doing in that, at that particular time. So we know generally where that airplane is and then we know, where the, we know exactly where that camera is on the airplane. So that position, when we take that photograph, we're saying, okay, we're pretty sure it's in this location using the GPS on the airplane. You can have ground control points as well, which will allow you to get a higher accuracy. But any kind of um, terrain distortion is going to cause it to shift and you're going to have some different errors that happen within it un until you've actually done some processing with it to create something called an orthophoto. So the positioning in the actual aerial photo can actually be off. So that's what we mean by approximate. And I'll show you why later on here. But then scale as well as also approximate. There are always a, there's always a scale written on an aerial photo. That scale is what they are aiming for. It doesn't mean that's necessarily what they got, because even like one meter difference is going to change that scale when you're looking at the aerial photo. And then also, if you have a change in terrain, the airplane's not going to follow the terrain exactly as is. Usually, they follow a straight line. So the scale value is going to vary depending on what the terrain's doing. If we want to really view that terrain, we need to have two photographs. We need, in order to create three-dimensional images, we need to, to put together two photographs. Um, and then finally, if you have poor lighting, like let's say you get up really early in the morning and the sun's not quite out, but it's just starting to peak up and it's not very bright, you can end up with issues trying to interpret it. So the timing of the aerial photos is also very important. So moving on to objective 2.2 is to identify three types of films and list their advantages, disadvantages, differences, and similarities between them. Um, I'm going to introduce them, and that's what I'm going to do in this lecture. Otherwise, we could sit here forever. <laughs> so in class, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about advantages, disadvantages, and comparing and contrasting them. But in this particular lecture, we're going to talk about just really what they are. So there's actually three different, three, well, three major kinds of film we can consider more. There's actually more kinds out there. But the first one is the panchromatic, and this is your black and white image, right? So you can see it's gray. You can see that the, like it's got gray values, and gray values is the intensity of the reflection from the ground. That's how it interprets if we think back to the last lecture. So that intensity, how if it's really bright, it means it's getting lots of energy back from the ground. If it's dark, it means it's getting very little energy back from the ground. Um, the neat thing about panchromatic is that it uses ultraviolet all the way up to infrared in one single um, band. And so what I, when I say a band, what I mean is that it is how much of the electromagnetic, like what is the, the range of the electromagnetic spectrum that, I, that this one picture is covering and how much is it averaging or totaling that amount of energy. So we can say with the panchromatic that there's only one band but it's a very wide band. So it stretches from ultraviolet to infrared. And then it gets all of that energy and totals that, that energy onto the film. So, um, so what, what's nice about this one is that because it takes all of this energy in one single shot, um, it has a very high signal to noise ratio, which means that there's very little noise. So, in, like in this image, you, you might say, oh, it's kind of hazy in this in the center here, a little bit hazy here as well. Yeah, perhaps, but it could also be the angle with the sun is at, and that can, that can have some um, 
cause some error to it as well. But if I were to go in and actually measure like the pixel values in there, I can create a very strong relationship between what, what's in these hazy areas versus this one here as well. So that's what we mean by that signal to noise ratio. And then the panchromatic itself actually has a very, much higher spatial resolution. Um, that is why, for example, if you get married and you get black and white images done, they tend to look a lot sharper. And that's just because of that higher spatial resolution that it has. There's always a trade-off. So one band, one great big band on the electromagnetic spectrum, which is what panchromatic is, has a lower spectral resolution. And then, but in exchange, because I have lower spectral resolution, I have a higher spatial resolution. And we'll be discussing a lot more about resolutions in, in the future here, but in, in a following module, but that, that's an important factor to keep in mind when you're dealing with the, the panchromatic film. So the next kind of film is a natural color film, or it's also true color film. So you see different ways of it being written. So it looks natural. It looks like what we would expect to see on the ground. So vegetation's green. You know, buildings are different colors. The um, the roadway is gray. Water is like darkish bluish. So that to us looks very natural. So if we're looking at the um, when we're looking at this, it's using the same type of features that our eyes use, which would be the red, green, blue, right? So that th those particular bands on the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have red, which is a band, and then green is a band, and blue is a band. So that means that the bands are much smaller. So if you think back to the panchromatic, we think, okay, it has a very wide band. Then we look on the electromagnetic spectrum, or a very large range of energy. The red energy is actually a very small part of that. The green energy is a very small part of that. And the blue energy is a very small part of that. So then we take that data and we put that into our film. And then we visualize it. And now it looks exactly like what we would normally see. So we have cones in our eyes. They detect RGB. So if you're colorblind, what is kind of handy about this is that it, you can do everything in, in basically color by number, right, instead. So it becomes a numerical game rather than a visual game. And that, that actually, um, I actually prefer using the numbers because it gives me a little bit more concrete of an answer and doesn't make the, the screens don't cause any issues when I'm looking at it. So this one's like kind of in between with spatial and spectral resolution. We're actually finding that the spatial resolution is starting to improve over the years. Um, it's getting to be very competitive with the panchromatic image. Um, for example, the best spatial resolution that we can get with a, with a satellite is about 30 centimeters. And we'll describe that later. But in aerial photographs, depending on how close you are to the ground, you can get very quite good spatial resolution. So it just depends on where you're sitting. And that's what tr like natural color film. So the other kind of film that is important in this class is what we call the color infrared film. And so this is this is actually normal. <laughs> okay. This what we see here is we have changed it so that the near infrared is showing up as red as color. Because if we think about it, like what color do we see with our eye would we see with our eyes as near infrared? Well you can't. There is nothing out there that we cannot see infrared light. Like our eyes are not built to be able to see that. So we need to give it a color. So we anything that has a very high infrared or near infrared specifically, high near infrared reflection is going to look like red. So we kind of shift it a little bit along that electromagnetic spectrum. We drop the blue entirely. We don't need that one. And in the color infrared, we use green and red. So what happens here is that the near infrared is red, the green is blue, and the red is green. Whoa, what happened there, right? So that is called a composite, and we actually have composites with true color as well. Once we get into aerial, or sorry, into space imaging, 
I'll talk a little bit more about these composites and what it really means. But so the near infrared, just imagine just shifting it up a little bit. So we, we move from blue, green, red, and now we're going green, red, near infrared, and the near infrared is what we're seeing as green, red is, or sorry, near infrared is what we're seeing as red, the red is what we're seeing as green, and then the green is what we're seeing as blue. So that's why it looks really funny. But it allows us to see a lot more information about the vegetation itself. So the, when, in terms of spatial resolution, it's exactly the same as uh, natural color. And sometimes it can be worse just because of the near infrared wavelength. It's just it, the wavelength is longer. So therefore, we have a heart, like more of a trade-off with that because it's just a longer wavelength. But. And then, um, and then the spectral resolution, same because we have three bands that we're working with when we're doing that. So we want to compare it all. Here's, here's what it really looks like, right? So I'm, I've been using examples of Parliament Hill because it, it's freely available everywhere. So we've got, um, well, we've got four different examples here. So we have the panchromatic, which is, you know, grayscale. So this takes everything from ultraviolet all the way up to infrared. Then we have just infrared. So this one is not a combination of the panchromatic band, where the panchromatic band is really big. We're now just looking at a small part of the near infrared. So, oops. So you can see that the vegetation in this one shows up darker because vegetation doesn't reflect a lot, but it reflects a lot in the infrared, near, specifically the near infrared. Water absorbs it. Here, it looks a little bit more gray because the panchromatic has the ultraviolet that's also reflecting data for us and all kinds of stuff happening here. But in here, it gets absorbed. So here's the natural color. So you guys have already seen that. So that looks pretty normal. And then we have the color infrared in this one, which shows the vegetation. Now, what's interesting about this is that you can see, like, I mean, if you look closely, you'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, I can see this vegetation here. But it really stands out along, like, in these areas. And then over here, there is this, like, we can actually really make out this shape here, where here you can make it out as well. Um, but what, com what it comes down to is the trees and the type of vegetation. We can really highlight the edge of the trees in here because it really stops with that kind of red. Or up here, you know, it's kind of a blurry edge. This one, it just, uh, who knows? <laughs> and, then, and here it's also kind of a fuzzy edge as well, where this is very clear as to where that tree stops. And then you can also identify in here a little bit more clearly and with higher contrast areas of where the grass maybe has been tread on a little bit more, people walking along it. And you can compare it a little bit easier between sections, like here seems to be nice and green or, and good vegetation versus over here. But you don't really see that difference between the two if you're looking over here. So. With that, the, it's just different films are going to show you different things. Vegetate, anything to do with vegetation, you pretty much are going to pull up the near infrared and you're going to work with near infrared. That's just kind of a standard with industry standard across the board. So those are the three types of so panchromatic, true color, and color infrared. Those are the three types of film. Now there are four, they claim there's four types of cameras. I'm going to attempt to figure out what four types of cameras are in this class because <laughs> I didn't write that particular objective. But there are three main cameras that we can use. Um, and then there's like der derivations of each of them. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So a frame camera is what you would consider your standard camera. It is also known as a metric camera. Um, it is very high. Um, high accuracy, so it helps actually remove the distortion. So you put this in the interior, like you can either put it on the drone or you can put it into the airplane or the helicopter and point it down. And it captures one scene at a time. So as you fly along, it says, I'm going to take this entire image and I'm going to take that picture. Then you go to the next spot, takes that picture again, right? And then just keeps moving it along as it goes. And it's not, it's not taking the same one over and over and over again like it's showing here because this one looks like it's all over and over again, you're actually shifting along. So I would, I would have kind of overlap 
of each of these of the next particular image. So that's a frame camera. Um, it, it, it us usually we use 23 centimeter by 23 centimeter film. So it's actually a square. So if you, if you are printing it, that is the scale that it should be at. It should be on a paper that allows for 23 centimeters by 23 centimeters. Um, yeah, so nothing else really to say about it. You can have it film or digital. Everything's kind of going digital. So it's unlikely that you're going to see a film-based frame camera anymore, but you, you might in, in industry. Then the next kind is a panoramic camera. It has actually a couple other names. It's called a whisk broom scanner or an across track scanner. So it actually scans. And it scans back and forth across the image in like across the direction of flight. So you can imagine in this image, I'm flying this way. So if I'm going from this side of the page to over here, it's collecting data, sweeping back and forth. So it collects it here, goes there, and then goes back and then back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it has this rotating prism, um, a lens that kind of stays the same, and then a flat film that it is actually recording on. The scanning is accomplished by rotating the prism. So I just rotate it back and forth. It, it's scanning. So you can imagine that's how the best way to describe it is scan. It scans it rather than taking a, a photo. There's always scale variation, so you can see it's really distorted in this case, um, but it it tends to be um, it, it it's named panoramic or sorry panchromatic distortion should be panoramic that should be fixed it's not panchromatic distortion so they they go back and forth it collects the data as we go and um, and the, the nice thing is it's a really fast acquisition as well. And, but it does have a moving part in it, which some people are concerned about that. This is a, more common in like a LIDAR situation, but really high altitude reconnaissance surveys is really when you're going to use this one. And then it also covers much larger ground than the frame camera, so I can actually go further and cover more area in one flight. So if you're trying to save money on flights, that's a, a good one to use. The next kind is a continuous strip camera. So I, in aerial, photo aerial photography and satellite imaging, we have different terminology, but this kind of camera is also known as a push broom scanner or a long track scanner. So you can imagine I'm just picking up one full line at a time as we go. So I'm flying along and it's like picking up the data. The only thing that's moving is the film on the inside. So it's just picking up every row of pixels as we go. And it would just the direction of flight is along the along the strip here, and we collect it together. So you can see that the distortion is much less. You don't have that, um, and it just it, what's nice about this one is that it's just going to collect the data in one row, right? So if you if you're trying to keep limit the amount of time in the air, you can collect all the data in one row, turn around and collect a different row, and just go back and forth that way, and not have to worry about overlap. But if you're trying to look at anything in 3D, this is not an optical camera for that. So I guess getting into like the other kind of cameras, I think that's what they mean by this. The other kind would actually be an oblique camera where it's pointing to the side. Um, but I have to explain what that means if I before I get too far with it. So there are raw photographs that we use. So the photograph is being taken as we go, this one has no processing done. And there are three kinds. So there's vertical, which is straight down within three degrees of the vertical line, which is known as the nadir. We'll talk about that later. That's perpendicular to the ground. So look straight down, like where you're standing. If you put your head straight down and look straight down to the ground, that is what we mean by a vertical photograph. Low oblique means you're looking at it less than 30 degrees from the side, like just from the, the center line, and but you don't see the horizon, right? So I'm still seeing an area on the ground and I'm only looking at the ground. I don't see the sky, 
where high oblique means I have a much greater than 30, or not much greater, but greater than 30 degrees. And I actually can see the horizon. So that would be like looking at an airplane and seeing the ground and the sky as well. Or us walking around, right? We, we walk with our head up and look straight out. That's greater than 30 degrees. It's almost 90 degrees. And we can see the sky from there. So the types of these types, just another like way of visualizing it. So you can see a vertical camera looks straight down. We can create a grid like straight up with our with our images based on the pixels. A low oblique, so you can see that it's off a little bit. This is the optical axis that comes down here, and you can see that it still covers the ground here. But we can see that there's a scale distortion from the front of the the bottom of the image to the back of the image, or the top of the image, I guess I sh should say. It's like front and back. <laughs> um, so you, you, this starts becoming a little bit harder to actually do any math with. And then we have the high oblique, which is where you're going to see that horizon. And so you can see the horizon here. You can see how much that scale changes. So again, that scale distortion makes it really hard for us to do any kind of mathematics with it. So then we have a way that we can process this. So this would be, we need to have cameras that have overlap, which means that you have to have a frame camera. Um, or you can have a um, the push broom scanners and have them overlap. That also works as well. So we have two different kinds of perspectives. First one is a perspective projection, and the other one is orthogonal. So the perspective is when you're seeing the sides of buildings and sides. So if I was taking an, a photograph, here's the center of the photograph, and I would see more of the side of the cone. I would see the side of the building inside of a cylinder, right? If I was taking it here. Where orthogonal means I look straight down at the top. So the cone would look exactly like a, a basically a circle. The building's just a square and a cylinder is just a circle as well. So here's another example using buildings. So you see the top of the building really well versus the side, which is the perspective projection. So you can actually adjust this in post-processing. And, um, and there's a lot of processing that you need to do to be able to do that because we have to look at the terrain as well and adjust for that. So you can see here the, the scale and the distortions have the roads off in this perspective projection, where once we do the orthogonal projection, the roads actually overlap quite nicely. So once you've done an orthophoto, then you can have a correct scale and a mathematically correct image to be able to determine angles and distances in all in one. So before I move on to the next um, the next objective, I'm going to stop here and we'll be moving into the geometric characteristics of this. So building on to these different projections, um, building on to the concept of using a vertical photograph because we're going to stick with that and that will be in the next video.